Lead us from the unreal to the real. Lead us from darkness unto light. Lead us from death to immortality. Om. Peace. 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 Namaste and good morning everybody. Uh, we are here for a special session which, is, which we call Ask Swami. In this, what we do is, we have all these questions from all over the world, large numbers of questions which come in. And, uh, you know, writing back was never a very effective way of dealing with the questions. Nobody's ever sit satisfied with one, a few lines on email. It's much better to discuss it, and this way it gets preserved online also. Unfortunately, we cannot deal with uh, all the, we cannot take up all the questions. There are literally thousands of questions. We take up only a representative sample. And our brave team, uh, <laughs> uh, they go through this, uh, the email over months, and they select some and present it in, this, in, the, in these sessions. We try to have one per month. So Diane has the questions for today. But what we do is we interview it with questions from the live audience. So you are here. You've braved the miserable weather <laughs> to come here. And uh, we have hundreds of people um, joining us online also. So people here will take some questions from the uh, online audience first. And then I'll ask you to raise your hands. When you raise your hands, I'll call upon you. Come up here. Tell us your name and ask the question. All right. Diane, what do we have today? The first question is from Tom Hay in, in Asheville, North Carolina. He says, I'm a teacher of yoga and start every class by reciting the first three Patanjali Yoga Sutras as our reason for coming together to practice yoga. But I've, if I do not believe in an all-powerful, all-knowing God, and one of the three essential practices is dedication to God, then am I bound to fail in my spiritual pursuit of true liberation? Can atheists achieve enlightenment? All right, an important question. So he starts the yoga practice by chanting the first three sutras from the Patanjali, Patanjali Yoga Sutras, yeah. which is a very good way of starting a session on yoga. Atha uh, yoga anushasanam. Hence, a practice of yoga, the training in yoga. Anushasanam, the training in yoga. Hence, the teaching about yoga. The next question will be, what is yoga? Yoga chitta vritti nirodha. Yoga is the cessation of the movements of the mind. Stilling the minds is yoga. But what will happen if you still the mind, if you can successfully deeply quieten the mind for a prolonged period of time. This is what is called Samadhi in Yoga. The third sutra which he chants is Tada Drashtu Swarupe Avasthanam. Then the witness consciousness remains in its real nature. Because uh, what happens is, when the mind is active, thoughts are there, feelings are there, emotions are there, desires are there, uh, cognition is there, then the consciousness, the witness consciousness gets identified with that. Which is what is happening to us all the time. If the mind is restless, I am very restless today. If the mind, if there is anger in the mind, I feel mad at you. We don't say that I am witnessing a movement of anger in the mind. No, <laughs> that would be weird. It sounds more like a stand-up comedian. We say I am mad at you. What has happened is the fourth sutra, which he does not chant, the fourth sutra is Vritti Sarupya Mitaratra. If you do not still the mind, if the mind is not in the state of Nirodha, Samadhi, then whatever movements happen in the mind, the witness consciousness gets identified with it. And we feel, I am thinking that, I am feeling that. That becomes my reality, which is our day-to-day -day reality. So the first three sutras, to notice ourselves, to realize ourselves as this, Witness consciousness, not body, not mind. I am Sakshi, Purusha, 
consciousness. So this is the whole purpose of Patanjali Yoga. Now he asks a question there. One of the key practices for yoga is called Ishwara Pranidhana. Dedication to God, surrender to God, worship of God. But he says, now this is a problem for me. I don't believe in God. I really don't think such a God exists. Now here the answer must be a little nuanced. First of all, there is this peculiarity. The God that yoga philosophy, Patanjali talks about, is not quite what we understand by God. What do we understand by God? By we I mean all theistic religions in the world. The various traditions of Hinduism and Christianity and Islam and Judaism and Zoroastrianism. All of these traditions which believe in God. One common characteristic of God is that God is the reality, the power behind this universe. Is the creator, preserver, destroyer, at least the creator God. Everything here has been created by God. God is the source of all things. God is the first cause. That's not the God Patanjali believes in. According to Patanjali, that sort of God isn't there. The source of all creation is Prakriti, is nature itself. Unmanifest nature becomes manifest. That is what is called creation. And God really doesn't have much to do with it. God is present, but Prakriti creates this universe. So the God that we find in Yoga Sutras that has just about all the characteristics of God except that it's not the creator of the universe. The God that we find in Yoga Sutras is like another Purusha, Purusha Vishesha, is a special kind of consciousness which is ever perfected. It's not like us which has to go through this process of discovering itself and becoming enlightened. It's ever perfected, ever free and has the capacities of omniscience and all of that. So yes, in some ways the God we believe in, in some ways not the God we believe in. So that's one nuance we have to add there. But suppose someone says, I don't believe in God at all. The disadvantage there is, as one sadhu said, Bahut bada sahara hai. It's a great, great support. If you believe in God, God is a great, great support. Not that if you believe in God, God becomes a support. God is a support anyway, whether we believe in it or not. Mm -hmm. But if you believe in it, you connect to it. You can depend upon it. You, can, you get benefit from it. We get benefit from it. A psychological benefit from it. Also material benefit from it. Suppose we don't believe in it, then we will not have faith, we will not worship, we will not connect, we will not pray, we will not ask for help. So that advantage is lost, that's all. But without that advantage, can one become enlightened? Technically, yes. The sister philosophy of Yoga Sutras, Sankhya, does not talk about God at all. The difference between Sankhya and Yoga, one of the differences, major difference, the one major difference is the, uh, the role played by God in the Yoga Sutras. God is accepted in the Yoga Sutras, this special kind of God, Purusha Vishesha, a special kind of conscious being. Uh, in Sankhya, it is not, they don't talk about it at all. In Sankhya, it is a process of analysis to see that I am the witness consciousness. So to sum it up, pull it all together, can one become enlightened in the context of Yoga Sutras, in the context of Sankhya philosophy, which is the background philosophy for the Yoga Sutras, without depending on God? Yes, one can, technically. Practically, different matter altogether. <laughs> Uh, one needs help in this world. You are giving up a huge support if you do not believe in God. Mm. That's all. All right, next. This question is from Krishnan Seshadri. The body-mind complex is said to be inert or jada and is only enlivened by the reflected consciousness. If so, how is this inert substance able to generate thoughts? Mm. Straight answer is the thoughts are also inert. Mm. What is meant by this is, they, you see, um, the word inert is, <laughs> it's in a close English uh, approximation of the Sanskrit word jada. And the jada also is used in a special sense in, in philosophy. Normally, in, even in 
Indian languages. When you say jada, it means something immobile, something like a rock maybe. But technically in Vedanta, in Sankhya, the word jada means an object. That which is not conscious, that which is not sentient. Mm -hmm. So inert is a close... Uh, <laughs> when I say inert, I'm reminded of, I don't know how many of you would have seen, um, there was this British BBC serial, Yes Minister. <laughs> uh, very, very humorous. It used to be on Indian television, one of the few English serials on Indian television. So I loved it. And it was about politics at the highest level in, in Whitehall, in, you know, in, in England, in London. And the bureaucrats who ruled everything, who ran everything, they were all educated in the classics in Oxford and Cambridge. They had the least idea about science and technology and they were not interested. Uh, that's superiority, you know. That you're, um, so the discussion was going on. The, the minister is talking about um, in, uh, gases. Some industrial, some plant is there, industrial plant and gases. And it says inert gas. It will uh, not react with any other substance. We all read, so, you know, from school chemistry, we had learned inert gas. And the bureaucrat, I think it was Sir Humphrey, he has no idea what an inert gas is. And the minister asks, do you know what you're talking about? You know, what's, what, what, what does inert gas mean? What does uh, inert mean? Inert means, he said, inert means it's not earth. <laughs> 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 what do you mean? <laughs> it won't earth a soul? <laughs> Which is in a way correct, because it will not react with anything else. <laughs> anyway, that's British humor for you. But jada here means an object. Uh, let us see it from our experience. What does jada mean, the word jada mean in Sanskrit and in Vedanta? In our experience, whatever you are aware of is an object. And that's jada. And that's a very interesting definition. Uh, because you're aware of the table. Then table is jada. We are aware of the clothes I'm wearing. It's jada. I am aware of the body. If I'm aware of the body, body is jara. Which becomes interesting because in our, even in, in Indian languages, when you say jara, you generally don't mean a living body. You just mean non-living things, they're jara. A living creature is supposed to be chetana, conscious, sentient. But by this definition which we are using in Vedanta and Sankhya, anything you are aware of is jara. This is jara, this is jara. And even more startling and amazing, yeah. If you go inwards and look inwards, all of us, we have thoughts, we have emotions, we have feelings. But because we are aware of those thoughts, emotions and feelings, they are also jada. Which is not at all the way in day-to-day -day life the word jada is used, even in India. In fact, it's just the opposite. If you say thoughts and feelings, are they jada or not? No, no, people would say, no, no, they, that is sentient. And things in the world, physical things outside are jada. But according to this definition, if you are aware of it, it is jada. And the only thing that is not jada, if you go further, in our own experience, if we see, and you let go of whatever is jada, I'm aware of the external world, so let go. I'm aware of the body, let go. Let go means turn your attention away. You can't let go of the body, don't let go. Huh? We have to call 911 otherwise. <laughs> turn my attention away from the body. The breath. Are you aware of the breath? That's how you do mindfulness meditation, vipassana, so it is jada. Then thoughts, emotions, memories are coming. Jada. Because you're aware of it. Even this technique which we're using, the understanding which we're using, intellect. But you're aware of that understanding, that the functioning of the intellect, the higher mind. That's jada too. Let go. And if you let go of everything, suppose the world has disappeared, there's no world. Other people are not. It's just close your eyes. I'm not seeing anything, hearing anything, smelling, tasting, touching. Why am I doing this? They are jada, so I'm turning my attention away from the jada to discover what is not jada. And then I look at the body also. That is also jada. So I turn my attention away from the body. Suppose you're not aware of the body also. Not aware of the world. You are not seeing anything, hearing, smelling, tasting. Try to simulate it in your mind. You're not even aware of the bodily existence, suppose. Not even aware of emotions, no excitement, no boredom, 
no pain no pleasure no unhappiness no delight just neutral you are not aware of any memory suppose memory is also gone complete amnesia you don't even remember my own name where am i what is all this it's everything is gone jada suppose and then intellect also stops no thinking no understanding nothing just blank jada then that blankness also i'm aware of the blankness drop that blankness also if you can jada what remains is bare awareness or not aware of anything at all you remain it feels like nothing you'll have to do the make the effort of dropping that nothing also then you will see it's light only but not an objective light not a jada light it's you and that you is not jada i don't know if that makes any sense no some of some of you understand uh, what is being pointed towards it's a darkness which also a luminous darkness because you are present there you're just not aware of anything there is no jada present to you no object present to you now he says the mind uh, and the intellect they are also jada how do they generate thoughts you can easily answer now you will say that those thoughts are also jada one jada is generating another jada what is important is the knower of those thoughts the experiencer of those thoughts the illuminer of those thoughts you you are not jada because you are not an object definition of jada anything that's an object anything that you can be aware of you are that which you are not aware of objectively careful here if i'm not aware of it then immediate consequences oh it's something that's unknown there are lots of things which i don't know in this universe i'm not aware of it not in that sense it's other than the known other than the unknown whatever i'm aware of is known jara but whatever i am not aware of whatever i do not know there are lots of things that i do not know but if you knew them would they be jara or not they would be jara so they are also in principle jara all the known and all the unknown are jara whether you know them or unknown uh, whether you know them or you do not know them the one which knows the one which is aware of all of that in itself is not jada because it cannot be objectified and yet it exists this is why we uh, get uh, confused at this point because it's not an objective existence because it is not a jada existence we think it doesn't exist it exists very much so you are it you exist there's no that's one thing that nobody can doubt my own existence so this ajara chaitanya this consciousness this awareness which is not a this that's the only thing which is not jara thoughts jara can generate thoughts no problem at all vedanta has no problem at all with it one jara thing is generating another jara thing mind is jara generating thoughts but the mind cannot generate you if you have a question hold on to that i'll call upon you okay so somebody is eager to ask a question we'll move on to that that's the answer uh, we'll move the lady there you have to come up here you have to come up yeah <laughs> tell us your name and ask the question there and then we'll take another question um the gentleman yeah will come and take it. tell us your name and ask the question speak into the microphone Uh, so my name is Rohini and what i wanted to understand is so if everything is jada then we are basically prakash because what i understood from um kashmir shivism is that when when you have um both prakash and vimarsha it is the prakash that illuminates the vimarsha and then you have you have understanding so when when uh when we are basically saying that if you only have prakash then there is no awareness in which case then you are what it is is that what we're saying okay there's a lot to unpack there <laughs> uh-huh. 
So if we are only awareness, what Rohini, the word Rohini used was prakasha, which means light. We're just like light. Light illumines whatever comes in front of it. I see like light is illumining this. Whatever comes in front of light is illumined. We are like that. Consciousness is like prakasha. But then she brought in another system of philosophy called Kashmiri Shaivism. Kashmiri Shaivism says, our nature is not just like light, it's prakasha, it's light definitely. Advaita Vedanta, Sankhya, Yoga, they all say our nature is prakasha, light. You're like, you are light shining, that's it, what you are. But Kashmiri Shaivism says, that's not enough. That light has to be aware of itself. It's not just illumining everything else. It has to also be aware that I am. That awareness should be there. Otherwise, the Kashmiri Shaivites, they criticize Advaita by saying that your Prakasha is as good as a rock because it does not know its own existence. Yeah. So what they say is, the ultimate nature is not only Prakasha, not only light, but self-aware light. This is called Prakasha Vimarsha. Vimarsha means the reflexive awareness that I am. Shiva is of the nature of awareness, light, but also aware that I am Shiva. Then you said something which you think you said is Kashmiri Shaivism, but actually Kashmiri Shaivism falls apart at that point. What you said is actually Advaita. You said, so I believe that this Vimarsha is illumined by the Prakasha. That's, those are the words you use, I remember. Uh -huh. That's what I understood. If you understood that Vimarsha is il illumined by Prakasha, the self-awareness is illumined by Prakasha, you understood right. That's what Advaita says. That's where Kashmiri Shaivism, uh, I think, my, in my opinion, trips. If you say that Vimarsha is illumined by Prakasha, immediately that Vimarsha becomes Jada, becomes an object. Prakasha illumines the Vimarsha. Vimarsha means I am Shiva. If that I am Shiva experience is illumined by Prakasha, by consciousness, then that Vimarsha becomes Jada. It is no longer part of Prakasha anymore. It's an object. Therefore, the ultimate reality, let me finish, let the ultimate reality remains as Prakasha, not as Vimarsha. What Advaita Vedanta says is this, follow this carefully, two-part answer. Advaita Vedanta says this Vimarsha, I am Shiva, is like I am Rohini, I am Sarva Priyananda. This is an activity of the mind. Can you do that? I am, uh, can I, I, at least I know I can't do it. I am Sarva Priyananda, I can't do it in deep sleep. Can you do it in deep sleep? But is Prakasha there in deep sleep? Yes. All these systems would say, Kashmiri Shaivism, Advaita, Sankhya, all would say in deep sleep, Prakasha is there. Consciousness is there, illumining the absence of everything. But you can't say, I am so and so. You can't do that in deep sleep. That, that reflexive awareness is not there. So pure, just, just follow your own experience. Track your own experience. So, that's one answer, that uh, one part of the answer, this reflexive awareness, I am so and so, that is part of the mind, not part of pure consciousness, not, not an aspect of pure consciousness. It requires the mind to do that. The, where I think Kashmir, where Advaita would uh, disagree with Kashmiri Shaivism or Kashmiri Shaivism would disagree with Advaita, they import a cognition of the mind into the ultimate reality. It requires the mind to make that judgment. All right. Now, what about the, then the original criticism remains of Kashmiri Shaivism. Then your Prakasha is not self-aware. Then, for example, without body, mind, Prakasha would not be aware of itself at all. It's as good as a rock. When you say Prakasha illumines the world like light, but that illumination also depends on mind, senses and body, through the mind, senses and body. By itself, it does not illumine anything. It does not illumine itself, it does not illumine anything. Your Prakasha is like a rock, like a table, it becomes almost like a jara. Even if it's consciousness, it has no, <laughs> no feature of being conscious. The answer there in Advaita Vedanta is that what we call Swaprakasha, self-luminous. Self-luminous means like the light. So the light, to, re to see anything in this room, suppose it's dark, you need to switch on a light then it'll, everything in the room will be revealed. All the non-luminous entities in the room will be revealed when you switch on the light. 
what do you what did you need to see all these things in the room you needed to add light i want to see table you need to add light look literally light has been added to it then i can see the table light is reflected back to my eyes what do you need to see the carpet you have to add light to it what do you need to see the um the ceiling you have to add light to it if i ask what do you need to see the light will you have to say you have to add light to it no you don't need to switch on another light the light reveals itself and reveal illumines everything else this is called swaprakasha self luminous then you will say how is this different from vimarsha it is different ha uh, see this was in darkness this is how it's different this was in darkness light came and removed the darkness and revealed the existence of this thing was the light ever in darkness no so that self revealing nature of light this is called self luminosity swaprakasha it does not reveal itself by destroying darkness it's not that it was unknown covered in darkness then it you know destroyed the darkness and revealed like it reveals jada objects light does not reveal itself like that consciousness does not reveal itself like that consciousness reveals by shining further follow up question might be we are entering very subtle levels of analysis further follow up question might be wait a minute then to do anything this consciousness of yours requires mind senses body world it depends after all for any experience on the jada your consciousness depends on the jada does it not and this is where sankhya and yoga the system we talked about earlier they will say yes they are f- fundamentally dualistic systems so say consciousness depends on the jada purusha depends on prakriti and prakriti depends on purusha how they gave the classic example of a lame man and a blind man the blind man can't see anything the lame man can see but cannot walk so what they do is the lame man climbs on the shoulders of the blind man and the lame man gives directions to the blind man go this way do this and this way and the blind man carries the lame so the blind is uh, nature material nature prakriti object jada and the consciousness the sight drishti is given by consciousness itself by purusha by sakshi by the prakasha and the two together they depend on each other one depends consciousness depends on uh, nature for any kind of action any kind of activity any kind of uh, and nature depends on consciousness for experience without uh, consciousness no experience is possible no anubhava is possible what we call life itself is life means our living life not the prana the experience of life that itself is not possible without consciousness the same intuition i think it was einstein who said in a much broader sense he said science without religion is blind religion without science is ineffective i'm paraphrasing i'm not i'm sure einstein didn't say exactly this something like that so the two of them together so consciousness and matter what does advaita say advaita says no consciousness does not depend upon material nature chaitanya sakshi does not depend upon jada you do not depend upon the jada what do you mean in two senses one straight forward is it to understand other one very subtle very difficult to understand one straight forward is it to understand because in advaita vedanta consciousness is the ultimate reality so what you call jada this body mind senses they are ultimately nothing but the effects the products the appearance of consciousness consciousness alone is appearing as this universe so it's not that consciousness depends on the jada on the table on the light on the eyes on the mind no 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 it is mind table light eyes all of them depend on conscious on the atman consciousness and existence for their wo- own existence and for their illumination satta and spurti do you follow this so atman brahman consciousness prakasha is the reality on which the jada depends because the jada is an appearance of that let me give an example uh, uh, 
dreams i'll ask you a question in our dreams it could be that you are walking around and seeing nature people places you are hearing beautiful music huh? you are tasting um, a nice a cookie and smelling fragrant flowers huh? and you are walking now if i ask are you seeing this beautiful nature say yes with what are you seeing the first answer will be with eyes but when we wake up what will you say that in my dream with my eyes i saw the beauties of nature i heard beautiful music with my ears no you will say the whole thing was imagined in the mind all the seeing hearing smelling even the eyes and the ears also were imagined by the mind in the dream there is nothing but the dreaming mind is it that it's not true it is the mind by itself which appears to be seeing it's the mind by itself which appears to be hearing in the dream they were not actual eyes the physical eyes and ears and actual forms and sounds to be heard whole thing the object and the subject and the instruments of knowledge eyes and ears they were all imagined in the mind dreamt in the mind true or not to so the mind does not depend the dreaming mind does not depend on the eyes and ears in the dream to see or hear in the dream no it doesn't it's the eyes and ears in the dream which depend on the dreaming mind exactly like that here in this waking world it is you the awareness upon which the entire waking world depends really awareness does not depend on this waking world for anything is quite tough it's okay yes. to understand getting your head around that kind of thing is quite <laughs> tough however one help might be one practical help is to listen again and again to study again and again huh? to study um then it's an unfamiliar way of thinking but these examples help listening to it again and again helps and what helps powerfully is if you as americans say keep it real keep it real means connect it to yourself when i say i am witness consciousness just saying that sounds awfully abstract but when i say forget the world forget the body forget thoughts emotions ideas not remembering anything not thinking of anything not sensing anything i still am what is the nature of that i am yes, you begin to see it's a fact it's not a very abstract kind of thinking it's it's what i am directly one monk said this way the way to understand vedanta is like the child holding a nose yes if you ask a child what is a nose the child will not say nose is that organ of um, olfactory organ organ of smell and that through which our respiration goes on he will not say that the child will say nose is this <laughs> this is a nose you must be like a child in vedanta what do you mean by pure consciousness you even if you can't explain to anybody else you can directly experience it for yourself you're there all the time you're there are you, are you not conscious and from consciousness if you abstract objects that is pure consciousness it's there it's you literally you it's the easiest of things to understand in one sense but it's not an object therefore it's not because we try to our understanding always tries to objectify that's why we find it difficult okay good and that gentleman first and then we'll take a question from the internet audience then we'll come to you tell us your name and ask the question uh namaste swamiji my name is alex uh first thank you for sharing your wisdom with us um my question is about freedom So in the Bhagavad Gita Krishna says that all decisions are taken by nature and the conscious individual is fooled into thinking that I am the doer when prakriti is responsible for all the work. Um or at least that is that is one my understanding. Then is the act of direct realization, the removal of ignorance entirely subject to prakriti and given the role of prakriti is the process of striving to self realization the foundation of vedanta's ethical principles or are those derived from something else okay this is uh, a question which will come up 
every time you have any kind of spirituality or any kind of philosophy indeed from the most ancient times till today it's a question of free will freedom how free are we to do anything at all first answer is we are free because all our um religion morals do's and don'ts they are based on the assumption you are free to do the right thing and free to do the wrong thing otherwise what's the point of uh, you know giving instructions if i'm not free to follow the instructions so we assume when you give instructions when you teach a child to be moral ethical when you give uh, spiritual instructions sit like this breathe like this withdraw your yoga instruction huh? all the at the physical level at the sensory level the mental level we must be free otherwise these instructions don't make sense ethics doesn't make sense what about law law doesn't make sense when you punish the guilty what is the uh, assumption that this person freely did the wrong thing he could have chosen to do something the right thing did not hence should be punished when you reward somebody for bravery or for good deeds done they freely did much more than they um, need have done and they have contributions are tremendous we recognize how they use their freedom we recognize or we punish how they misuse their freedom freedom otherwise our whole legal system will not work our whole consumer system you go to all the shops here what do you see menu so many types of coffee so many types of cookies and donuts and so many types of um, you know pizzas and what not what does that imply freedom even things which directly impinge your freedom advertisement multi million multi billion dollar industry what are they trying to do manipulate your freedom unless you are free to choose there's no use advertising to you also they're trying to restrict your freedom but uh, that way so law economics justice system ethics morality religion they all assume freedom they all assume freedom now you look at take a closer look is it is there really freedom when you take a closer look it seems no there cannot be freedom science if you have causality cause and effect this cause leads to that effect then whatever we are seeing here are they are all effects there must be causes behind it and those causes are effects of causes earlier so whatever is here in this universe is determined by past causes that means whatever we are doing is determined by past causes where is our freedom then in principle if you strictly follow causality no freedom freedom should not be there it's an aberration an anomaly in causality freedom should be eliminated causality reigns causes have effects uh, actions have consequences then religion comes and says you have no free will everything is the will of god sri ramakrishna himself says even a leaf does not move without the will of god mm. krishna says as you quoted in the bhagavad gita what do you think then why do we say we have free will all this you said you free will is assumed by law by economics then why do we assume at all this is because we are fooled krishna says in the bhagavad gita which we just quoted from the uh, it says prakriti eva karmani kriyamanani sarvasha yapashyati tathatmanam akartaram sapashyati nature prakriti is doing everything this is again sankhya philosophy patanjali yoga philosophy everything is being done by nature this is so much in tune with science so much in tune with modern any doctor physician neuroscientist they will all agree that's all determined nature is doing everything and you feel you are doing it you are getting fooled and krishna also indicates what's the mechanism of being fooled ahankara vimoda atma deluded by the ego the ego is is a function of the mind which appropriates to itself the activities of the mind so there is thinking going on speaking going on body is doing something what the ego says is i am thinking i am speaking i am speaking i am walking i am sitting these are activities of the body these are activities of the mind of the speech but the ego says i am doing it and we want to say am i not are you just imagine when i say i am speaking i just said a sentence how many things have to go right for it to happen 
what tremendous activity in the neurons in the brain to recover from the memory the english words i am thinking the sequence of those words the meaning of those words what tremendous activities go on from the ner- brain to the nervous system which activates uh, the vocal cords the tongue if i am given charge of all that will i be able to do it no chance at all nothing at all i won't be able to do a first thing how to recover the memories of the words from my memory i have no idea no idea it's all happening it's being done and served before me what do i do only one thing i do i the ego i say i am doing it no you are not no you are not nothing of this is being done by you and the amazing thing is modern neuroscience is now beginning to say the same thing and this has got many people worried richard sapolsky that book determined it's the latest offering there are other books like that also but the latest most comprehensive work recently richard sapolsky is determined he says if you take neuroscience seriously at least there's no possibility of free will we are being fooled into thinking we are free will okay now all that's background what about vedanta what does vedanta say about our uh, and what about ethics in vedanta is there free to free will according to vedanta the answer is nuanced vivekananda said free will is a misnomer in terms by the time freedom become there is only freedom atman is free brahman is free the pure consciousness is free in itself but when it becomes will i will do this i will you know i even think this i will say this by the time it becomes will it is already determined it's far down in the chain of cause uh, of causality when will it becomes expressed as will we were discussing this in the gita class day for yesterday when krishna describes what is the field field and the knower of the field what is the field kshetra and there he gives the sankhyan philosophy of 24 tattvas 24 principles basically the five elements air water fire earth and all of that and then the subtle elements which co- constitute our mind our intellect our sense of ego the powers of the senses the powers of the um, the body the the organs of action uh, these are all these are all um field and then he says sanghata chetana dhriti he says when the body mind complex this is the field it is created what happens you the consciousness get reflected there so there is a reflected consciousness here illumining the, the consciousness which we feel right now and then what happens there is the ego and this ego develops likes and dislikes sukha dukkha uh, iccha dvesha it says raga dvesha likes and dislikes and then he adds will dhriti will generates and then in this body mind complex i have likes and dislikes what i like those ones i will try to attain will what i dislike those ones i will strive to overcome or or get rid of will that's so far down in the chain of causation so that will is determined by what by likes and dislikes yes now in vedanta we have freedom and you know the interesting thing in vedanta is that which has freedom atman or brahman that is the ultimate reality so the ultimate reality is free our real nature is freedom and the whole of this from that perspective is an expression of that freedom within this game there is no freedom but the whole game is your expression and you are free it's like the director of the movie is free in the movie no character has freedom but you are the director luckily <laughs> you are free and this whole thing is your expression you are painting this picture until it's complete and you see and what does it reveal the your picture which you have painted is self portrait portrait it's a selfie as one's thinking i should give a talk the ultimate selfie <laughs> enlightenment is the ultimate selfie which shows you shows us what we are so that's the meaning of of freedom in vedanta If you want a more precise answer, I recommend Professor Arindam Chakravarti's "Why Pray to a God Who Can Hear the Anklets on an Ant's Feet." is quoting from Sri Ramakrishna's Kathamrita, the Gospel of Sri Ramakrishna. So there he analyzes. He first of all does a quick survey of all theories of determinism, no free will, 
all theories of libertarianism there is free will all theories of compatibilism there is free will and there is no free will both are compatible and then he comes to so what do we do now what's the point of it what does vedanta say he says his answer is very fine and nuanced this is the best answer i found to this question so far he says three levels first level yes there is free will we all feel free will second level if you analyze neuroscience philosophy spirituality no free will third level so so what what do we do acknowledge use the appearance of free will the feeling that we have we can't even if we come to the conclusion there's no free will we'll still act as if we have free will so use the appearance of free will to acknowledge that there is no free will that is a continuous act of surrender to god as long as we have these questions we are definitely jiva sentient being we are not absolute brahman brahman doesn't have this question there's no question of will in brahman brahman is free so as a individual being when the question of free freedom free will uh, is there for me the best answer from vedanta is acknowledge first of all that um, or use the the illusion of free will to acknowledge there is no free will uh, it is all you he he does it sums it up in sri ramakrishna's little formula na ham na ham tu hu tu hu not i not i thou my lord thou my lord you can do this because you feel your free will but you are knowledge is that there is no free will so put them together um question from the internet audience uh we ha- we have three questions on deep sleep swamiji it's going to put you to sleep <laughs> um The first one is from 19-year-old Rishi Singh who asks if Brahman is already fulfilled then what is the need of expressing itself as Ishwara Jiva and Jagat how can we confidently say that we are aware in deep sleep the mind can also simply create a fake memory of being in a deep sleep just to fill the void of that time when you were actually in deep sleep but were not aware of it similar to a comatose person who recovers and believes that he was asleep only for a day then we have nick gallagher who asks i okay, have okay let's take them one by one okay <laughs> uh, these are subtle questions actually uh, rishi has asked a two part question one is what's the point of the absolute reality brahman if that's the only reality why is it expressing itself as this triangle of jiva jagat ishwara the world us and god the world exists and i exist this much is clear to everybody that there is a god for that you need religion basically there is a cause of this world so these three things ishwara jiva jagat and according to advaita vedanta all three are actually there is only one underlying reality which is brahman why why would brahman do this if brahman is self fulfilled there's nothing that brahman wants why would brahman do it I think I've answered this question many many times but still uh, the ans- the question has to be asked and answered because this is a deep question which will come anybody who studies vedanta for a while will come to this question so if i am already brahman if brahman is the only reality if i'm already brahman then why all this if brahman is the only reality why is all this appearing same question if there's only one reality why is the many appearing you can't deny the many is appearing to you you can call it maya appearance but then even then you can ask why is it appearing at all so this question will come what are the answers um many answers have been given across the world's religions in vedanta also you'll get many answers one answer is brahman appears as all of this for our benefit uh, we are the beneficiaries we are on this journey of spiritual unfoldment and development for that we need a world uh, in which we can work out our spiritual development we need a school basic basically to grow to f- grow morally spiritually lifetime after lifetime we are going so this is one answer but it's a very kindergarten answer because you'll say you're already assuming that we exist as individual beings we're assuming that we are on this journey and then god is just helping us by giving us making a school for us <laughs> so the second 
answer, a deeper answer is, no, you're right. God is fulfilled. There is no need for God to do anything like that. Brahman is fulfilled, let's say. Because the moment you say God, what happens is, the three have already come. God, world and us. Then only God makes sense. Do you see? You can't have only God by, by himself, herself or itself. What is it a God of then? Ishwara literally means the ruler. Literally means the God of all things. But if there are no all things at all, what is it a God of then? What is it an Ishwara of? Ishwara means the controller. What does it control if there's nothing to control? So, moment you say Ishwara, Bhagavan, Saguna Brahman, already you're assuming world and jivas. But at all, why Ishwara, world and jivas, this three, he's asking, why at all, all of that? Uh, the answer is, you're right. Brahman doesn't need anything. It is Leela. It's a divine play. It's the play of Brahman. How does that help? In play, you don't ask. You don't ask. Why are you kicking the ball? The answer is, is play. Oh, but why are you playing? I like it. Oh, but why do you like it? There's no answer to that. I like it. That's all. It's play. So play subverts the causality question. Why? You need a rational answer for that. It's like asking somebody, you see somebody dancing and you ask, where are you going? I'm not going anywhere. I'm dancing. <laughs> so the dancer is not going somewhere. It's a wrong question to ask. There also one might have an objection. Because this is a poetic way of speaking. Play is a very human thing. Play is a human thing. Children play. Human beings play. Animals also play. The higher animals also play. But why would an absolute reality be play? What do you mean play of Brahman? Why would Brahman play at all? It's poetic. It's sweet to think about it that way. But why? So there, if you want a more rational answer, one answer is Maya. What is the answer of Maya? The one did not become the many. It remains the one. It only appears as the many. Why did you do all those things in your dream? The answer will be, I did not. Whatever happened in the dream, is the very definition of a dream is that it did not happen. It just looked like that. This is the Vedantic theory of Vivarta. Vivarta means apparent transformation. It looks like the cause became the effect, but it did not. It looks like the rope has become a snake. It has not. It looks like Brahman has become Ishwara Jiva Jagat. It has not. Brahman remains as Brahman. You see the answer here? In reality it has not. It appears to be. This is called Vivarta, apparent transformation. This also is problematic. You can push this question even further. You might say, why does it appear so? I understand. It has not become. Brahman is only one. This triangle, Ishwara, Jiva, Jagat, you see how it has taken a modern form. Many years ago, I heard a talk, brilliant talk by a great physicist who got the Nobel Prize just two years back, um, Roger Penrose? Yes. Roger Penrose, in Calcutta. He was visiting Calcutta. And the British Council had got him for a lecture tour in Calcutta. And the senior monk took me, I was a novice, and some other, um, uh, those who might be interested in this stuff, they took, they took me to listen to his talk. So he was giving a talk, and uh, he's very old-fashioned that way. No PowerPoint and things like that. And he was using OHP. Most people won't know. The older people will know what's an OHP. Overhead, pro the transparency is overhead projector. And so he was drawing sketches on that and was being projected there. He drew a triangle. And the triangle was human being, mind, mathematics, universe. Universe, human being, mathematics. In place of God is put mathematics. Mathematics is supposed to be the mind of God. If you understand mathematics, you understand the mind of God. And human being, us, and uh, the universe. Jiva Jagatishwara, same thing. And he says, the deepest question in science today, if you are at the cutting edge of science, is what is called the unreasonable effectiveness of mathematics. How is it that we are able to understand the universe? 
how is it mathematics which is an activity of the human mind can predict something in the cosmos what is the link i am thinking something and the cosmos is behaving like that galaxies are spinning that way quarks are behaving that way i am thinking something and predicting and i am discovering fundamental particles by mathematics mathematics predicted it and then you did you make cern and all of that and you discover the um, higgs boson how how is it something completely unseen utterly inhuman in the scale of existence so tiny that we cannot even conceive of it our mathematics mind working through mathematics captures something which nature reproduces how why and he stopped there of course vedanta will give the answer that because these three are not separate there is an underlying reality uh, which is appearing as these three as the human mind you as the world that you experience and as god of the mind of god all three are, are underlying there is one reality brahman existence consciousness place last answer is the answer which i like <laughs> it's a cute answer yeah. but in english one may might say being precious <laughs> it says the answer is this what else can poor brahman do you are asking why does brahman appear as the jeeva jagat ishwara now there are only two two options either brahman need not appear or it does appear if brahman does not appear you will say what a useless brahman doesn't do anything at all brahman is existence itself can it not appear as existing things can't it at least be a table and a chair and a yes it can so if brahman appears as existing things brahman is pure consciousness can brahman not appear as conscious experiences of pleasure and pain and understanding and memory and desire and perception yes brahman obliges okay okay i will ap- appear Brahman is Ananda itself. Can it not be experienced as you know, sukha dukha, pleasure and pain in this world? Brahman said, "All right, yeah. knock yourself out." Brahman appears as the world. Then we complain, "Why did Brahman appear as the world?" We grumble. What is the need? We are in so much trouble. Brahman created this world. Somerset Maugham, the English author, novelist, he writes with his dry <laughs> humor. He says. one feels brahman could have left well enough alone <laughs> need not have done all this but there are only two options one or zero yes or no brahman is giving both look at our own lives here there is something in our dreams also there is something in deep sleep nothing both are manifestations either as unmanifest or as manifest you remain the same if you want nothing good deep sleep is there you want something waking is there neither is good then you are there brahman <laughs> all right then uh, the next question was deep sleep we have answered that deep sleep question uh, it is not um, it is not a false memory it is uh, the latent state the unmanifest state that's what is deep sleep the second question on the question number 3 there's right. a right uh, uh, nick galaga Uh, I have an intellectual understanding of how consciousness is the ever-present, unchanging reality, and it's because of this that we are able to experience the changing nature of outside phenomena as they present themselves within awareness. The analogy of deep sleep and dreaming is often used. My experience of deep sleep is not that of an unchanging awareness. I seem to disappear in deep sleep. When I wake up, I realize I am still alive. but i have been sleeping when i have thoughts and look at the clock seeing that time has passed i don't feel aware during periods of deep sleep therefore it seems to me that awareness much is much more reliant upon my physical brain than vedanta claims it to be my real world experience is that when my brain is not turned on in deep sleep i am unaware what proof do i have that i am aware of nothing as i have heard you say before if i have no recollection or experience of this nothingness and there's one other question okay from sokin saka if deep sleep is the experience of absence then what is death mm. all right 
So this is a probing question on the Vedanta position on deep sleep. In deep sleep, so here we are aware there are objects, uh, jada, and we are aware of it. Suppose all objects were taken away. There is an absence of objects. I don't see, hear, smell, taste, touch. I don't think, I don't remember, I don't feel, uh, I don't desire, I don't hate, I don't understand, I don't remember, I don't forget. None of them, all of them are shut down. Am I the awareness gone? Or am I there but there is no object for awareness? So here, right in front of me, right here, there is a lot of light. You can't see, it just seems blank. But now see, doesn't it shine golden? If I remove it, is it shining here? No, right in between. Nothing. But if I put it there, it shines. You're not in seeing my hand. You say, but you're showing your hand. I'm showing the light reflected from my hand. If I remove it, the light is right there, but you don't see it at all. You need an object to reflect light. On that analogy, what I'm saying is, what Vedanta says is, you are Prakasha, you are awareness. But in deep sleep, because the senses are shut down, because the mind is shut down, there's nothing to be aware of. There's this blankness. Now, the problem here is, our idea of awareness is so connected with the mind. When the mind shuts down, we feel, I am not there. This has to be understood in depth. Otherwise, we will say that deep sleep means nothing. Coma means nothing. General anesthesia means nothing. I was speaking with... Uh, one of the leading neuroscientists in the world today, Dr. Anil Seth, just the other day. He is the head of the neuroscience department in the University of Sussex. And a very, very nice conversation, very nice conversation. One of the arguments he used, and any neuroscientist in these days, most neuroscientists will use, is that in deep sleep, in general anesthesia, you're not there. Consciousness disappears, the self disappears. You're just not there. We can knock out all consciousness. By the way, when that, um, he used the language when the brain is turned off in deep sleep. Brain is not turned off in deep sleep. And Dr. Anil said also said, every neuroscientist knows this. Plenty of activity goes on in the brain. Generally turning off would mean death. But even neuronal activity, plenty of neuronal activity goes on in, de uh, in deep sleep. Yeah. Much less so maybe in um, coma, or different kinds of coma. So brain is not turned off. That's also an interesting argument. If consciousness is a product of brain activity, there's plenty of brain activity in deep sleep. There is also brain activity in general anesthesia. Plenty of it. All right, that's coming from the physical side. From the inner side, what we will say? We will say that what general anesthesia does, what deep sleep does, what some forms of coma will do, only some forms, other forms of coma, the person is uh, fully aware inside. Uh, people don't know. Sometimes, horribly, people are aware under general anesthesia, mm. including operation. They just can't say anything. <laughs> they're being cut and pierced, and <laughs> uh, but they can't say anything because all the motor organs are frozen, but you're aware inside. So, but even assuming that all objects of awareness are gone. That's what general anesthesia does. It does not knock you out. It knocks out every jada padartha, every object of awareness. There is no pain or pleasure. There are no perceptions, no memories, no ideas. Why this is a um, difficult thing for modern consciousness studies people to understand is because they do not distinguish between consciousness and mind. Certainly the mind is switched off in deep sleep. Certainly the mind is switched up in, in um, general anesthesia. By the way, another thing, brain and consciousness. You know, you can cut into the brain and be fully conscious at the same time and you won't feel anything because there are no nerve endings in the brain. So many, I heard it sounds gruesome, but many um, brain operations are done when you're fully conscious and you won't feel anything at all. In fact, the neuroscientist wants you, the surgeon wants you to be conscious during brain operation. So that if you cut something, did you lose the power to speak? 
did you <laughs> did you suddenly become blind did you do this <laughs> they'll be aware that you're not removing something very essential huh? <coughs> so this is the crucial answer why we feel he writes i feel i don't exist during deep sleep i don't feel that i was aware of nothing in deep sleep because two reasons one reason is what you think of as awareness or consciousness is the mind that was not there in deep sleep that was definitely switched off or in a hibernating state and that's why you felt i was not there if one does the drig drishya vivek or the panchakosha vivek or avastha tray vivek any of these vedantic procedures thoroughly thoroughly then one will begin to get an appreciation of what is meant by consciousness apart from mind consciousness in itself apart from objects then at least the intellectual possibility that in deep sleep i am still there even if you feel you see when you say i felt i was not there in deep sleep who says that mind the moment the mind wakes up it says i was not there of course you were not there you were not there but that doesn't mean i was not there i the witness of the mind i was witness i am witness of the absence of the mind i am witness of presence of the mind the absence of the mind was also witnessed by me i was there the mind says i did not know anything there but if the mind was switched off what is it that did not know anything there things like this so our uh, way of thinking is i woke up and i saw time has passed so i must have slept i was in deep sleep we don't do that even the person who wrote wrote it doesn't do that you might see the clock and say oh i slept for an hour i slept for 2 hours i fell asleep but just to the intuition of having fallen asleep we don't need to look at the clock you have a clear feeling that there was a moment of gap in between even the most inadvertent sleep you fell i slept off and then i'm awake now what notice that sleeping that sleeping you see if there was no experience of deep sleep we would not even talk about it hmm. every civilization every culture in the world has words for deep sleep has descriptions of the uh, experience of deep sleep it's an experience if it is an experience then consciousness must be there Deep sleep is a good way of distinguishing consciousness from mind. If you think there is nothing in deep sleep, you are talking about the mind. If you understand that I am there as bare awareness in deep sleep, as a something in deep sleep, that much you are aware, that much you can at least say, then you are aware of the distinction between yourself and the mind. Another reason why deep sleep seems so mysterious and nothing because our idea of something is in something object jada if all jada is removed then nothing so there there was nothing even that experience of nothing it's an experience it's not an absence of experience it's an experience of absence yeah. it will not be resolved so easily because our our uh, testimony seems to run our experience seems to run Uh, contrary to the claims of vedanta vedanta says our experience seems to run my experience seems to tell me there was nothing in deep sleep vedanta says you have to think a little more clearly in waking not in deep sleep <laughs> you have to think about deep sleep a little more clearly and keep thinking about it you will begin to see it is also a kind of experience an experience of absence waking and dreaming are experience of presence gross objects present waking subtle objects present dreaming no object present deep sleep the blankness itself can be considered an object some schools of vedanta panchadashi considers the blankness itself to be an object avabuddham tat tada tamaha in deep sleep you experienced oh what did i experience an object oh what object was there in deep sleep tamaha darkness tama bodho bhavet smriti hi panchadashi says that the experience of blankness in deep sleep is a, is like a memory when i wake up when i wake up there is a memory quote unquote memory memory requires a mind but mind was sleeping there so it can't be technically memory but something was experienced and a trace of it was left in agnana itself 
in the anandamaya kosha uh, in the karana sharira which the mind grasps and says there was a phase after dreaming there was a complete blankness that is deep sleep and that's an experience the consciousness was there and if you cannot accept consciousness in deep sleep then you are unable to distinguish between mind and consciousness you are still stuck on mind what is the difference between deep sleep and death in death one might be fully conscious near death experiences show that one might be conscious when there is physical biological death in death it might be like a dream experiences might be there death might be like deep sleep and then we awaken from deep sleep and then you are in heaven or the other place <laughs> other experiences will come <laughs> so those are also experiences so death is um, not might be like deep sleep for a while but might be like dream also for a while post death all right yes you have a question please come here and ask tell us your name and ask the question and make it brief okay hello good morning uh my question um although it might be a rudimentary one um relates to applying discernment um in the practice of shavana manana and nididhyasana um recently i'm noticing uh my efforts in the first two have waned and perhaps this diminishment is seeping into nididhyasana as well um So if these efforts have changed in their intensity does that mean even though they felt inherent or intrinsic they were never real or true to begin with One reason of lack of intensity might be just the mind any kind of spiritual practice that we do whether it's japa or meditation or worship or prayer or vedantic inquiry uh, yogic meditation any kind of spiritual practice that we do it will go through waves ups and downs that's the very nature of the mind it cannot hold on to something with unending intensity for years months and years it will wane but don't give up one must not give up it will again take an upward turn if one gives up then a lot of time and effort is wasted you will pick it up again but a lot of time and effort is uh, lost then uh, so hold on to it even if the spiritual practice not just shravana any other spiritual practice even if it seems mechanical even if you think i'm just going through the paces that intensity is gone still do it you'll see the intensity will come back again don't worry about the intensity of the mind i am a spiritual seeker i am a sadhaka i am the atman itself what else will i do except spiritual practice so even if shravana manan and nididhyasana seem to be a little low key and not going at intensity fine continue with it always supplement it with other spiritual practices meditation repetition of mantra chanting if you do a ritualistic puja little worship that's also great service is very great uh, going out of oneself all these practices are sort of private practice <laughs> but service is what takes us into contact with the vast with the virat with the with the people around us and that's a great blessing in our lives so the answer is yes spiritual practice will go through waves ups and downs don't bother about it it will never be really very great all the time that can't be that is something wrong if everybody is as a spiritual practitioner has a big smiley face continuously throughout <laughs> now sometimes yes goes well sometimes it doesn't so again it will go well continue all right you have a question please come here and we'll end with that question Tell us your name and ask the question. Pranam Swami ji. Yes. My name is Manjula Vani. You can make the microphone a little closer to your mouth. Yes. My name is Manjula Vani. Yes. Uh, my question is, uh, what is breathing? Is breathing Atman? Hmm. And my second question is, when somebody dies. we wish that may god give peace to the departed soul hmm. now if soul is atman hmm. and if atman is brahman as hmm. i understand and brahman is uh, uh, i mean consciousness unlimited 
So how can it depart? Mm. That's my question. It's interesting that you asked the question about breath. <laughs> yeah. Thank you. Why, in ancient Greece, the word for breath—I don't know how to pronounce it. P n e u m a. Does anybody know how to pronounce that? Pneuma, uh, from which pneumatic has come. Uh, so that also stood for soul. Over time, when Greek philosophy was absorbed into Christian theology, the importance of breath sort of faded to the background, and soul, the spiritual soul, became important. That became central. But breath and soul were connected, both in ancient India and in ancient Greece. Why they were connected? Because soul has two meanings. The word soul has two meanings. One is Brahman or Atman, as you said, pure consciousness. But one is also Jivatman, the sentient being. Other than the physical body, whatever else we are is called the soul. Physical body dies, but the soul, there the soul includes Atman, pure consciousness, Karana Sharira, causal body. Sukshma Sharira, subtle body. So that is the soul. Uh, pure consciousness plus causal body plus subtle body. What we call breath, prana, is very much, it's the constituent of the subtle body. And that's the most, uh, prana is also very interesting because it's the one which is automatic in our um, physiological processes, but we can also voluntarily catch hold of it, the breathing, uh, the breathing part of it, pranayama. So the so prana breathing is identified with the soul or is an identifier for the soul. For which soul? Jivatma. Why? Because prana is part of subtle body. In subtle body, karana sharir and consciousness together are called the jivatma, subtle, or one meaning of the word soul. The other meaning of the word soul is pure consciousness itself, the spiritual soul, atman. Now, when somebody dies physically, Physical death. What do we say in India? Pran nikal gaye uske. The prana has gone out of this person. That means the subtle body has left. Prana goes away means subtle body has left with the prana. That means this, this body is no longer a living body. Soul has gone. Prana goes, goes means soul will go with it. Soul means the jivatman. The causal body, subtle body. And pure consciousness. Pure consciousness will not go anywhere. According to Advaita, it's always there, shining. Another way of putting this is, in English we say, the dead person has given up the ghost. In India we say the prana, the sukshma sharir. What do we say? Ve chale gay. That person has gone. In English it's the reverse. The body is there and the body has given up the ghost. But the meaning is the same. The ghost here means the subtle body or the jivatma. To sum up my answer to your question is, the breath is very closely connected to the subtle body. So sometimes breath was taken as the soul or as an indicator of the soul. Living being means soul is there in this body. Dead body means soul has left. How do you know? When the soul is there, subtle body is there, therefore breathing is going on. When the soul is not there, gone away, subtle body has gone away, prana has gone away. Breathing stops and all the physiological processes which continued this body slowly fade away. That's the death of the body. Now the second question was, Brahman, if the soul is Brahman, why do we pray? May God give peace to the soul. Soul is Brahman. But two meanings of soul. Atman or Brahman is the one meaning of the soul. The other meaning is the subtle body, causal body, the Jivatma. Jivatma, for that Jivatma we pray to, to God. That as long as we are not enlightened, as long as we are individual, we will continue to be a Jivatma. We will go from this life to another life to another life. And for that departed, literally departed, for that departed person, we pray, may God give peace to that soul. In Hindi sometimes we say Sadgati. A, a higher destiny, spiritual destiny. May they attain higher births, better births. May they go to various heavens and come back as a spiritual person in next life. This is the prayer we give. Should we take one more question? Thank you. Okay, one more question. Slowly. Hmm. 
This is the question from the 16-year-old boy, Swamiji. Oh. His Gaurav Biswas is 16 years old from Assam, India. I have been following your sessions and lectures for almost a year now, finding immense solace and wisdom in your teachings. However, I am currently struggling with a deep sense of helplessness and anxiety due to the distressing events unfolding in our country. It has been increasingly difficult to adhere to the principles of non-dual Vedanta without being affected by the troubling circumstances around us. The political and social unrest in West Bengal, environmental and social movements in Ladakh, judicial and legal concerns in Pune, where wealth and influence corrupt justice, terrorism in Jammu and Kashmir, loss of educational integrity, infrastructure failures destroying cities, climate change affecting the poor, and the recent attack on the innocent medical student in Calcutta. While my intellect tells me to remain detached, my heart is deeply troubled by the suffering around me, though I know both exist in my mind. I've also contemplated the idea of karma yoga, offering selfless service to those in need, yet I struggle to understand how one can perform such actions when individual efforts seem negligible in the face of such widespread issues. Swami Vivekananda's commentary on karma yoga suggests that striving to correct the world's evils may be childish, yet he himself tirelessly worked for the betterment of society and motherland. So my question is, how can we practically apply the principles of karma yoga and Vedanta in order to remain unaffected by the world's challenges while still contributing mean meaningfully to the betterment of our motherland and the world, knowing that good and evil will always coexist. I humbly request your guidance on this matter. Mm. Very well written. Um, so to answer questions like this, I always refer to one book. Among the many books, there's one book on my table all the time. And that book is the annual report of the Ramakrishna Math and Mission, the general report. It talks about the hundreds of schools and dispensaries and hospitals and relief activities during flood and famine and uh, earthquake. Um, and uh, the educational services, the medical services, the rural development work being done. That is the first answer to suffering. Action. On whatever scale. You might do it at your individual level. Or you might do it at an organizational, national, international. What is the United Nations? An answer to your question. So this is the first answer. The first answer is one must do something. Not just uh, philosophical reasoning about it. But then, as he has noted, even if you do it, he said, the individual efforts are negligible. No, individual efforts are not negligible. First of all, individual efforts have to be made. Why? Whether negligible or not, because it's the right thing to do. Second, they are not negligible. They can take on a huge dimension. A lot of the great work being done across the world by non-profits and many organizations. They all started as individual efforts. If you are paralyzed by the enormity of the suffering and the relative helplessness of the individual, then you will not take any action. One must swing into action. I remember this young man. Um, he he takes care of 5,000 plus children who are underprivileged. Many of them are orphans and so on and so forth. And a lot of other work he does. Tremendous amount of work in India. How did he start? He was a graduate of the top business school in India. The top engineering school and business school in India. All his friends went on to multinational jobs in you know various countries in India and abroad. And he said, I... Somebody asked him, how did you decide to do this work, this tremendous work which you are doing? He said, I didn't. I couldn't decide what to do with my life. And then he said, this is the, you know, the intelligence of the, the approach. He said, um, if I can't decide what to do with my life, I thought, let me think, 
what is it that I don't want to do with my life? So do 